All right, this morning uh, we continue walking through what does the Bible have to say about the Holy Spirit? And today we are asking a number of questions surrounding baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so our, our endeavour, our desire is to answer the question, what does the Bible say about baptism in the Holy Spirit? Uh, just a, just a, a, a precursor before we get there, we must always uh, avoid falling into the error of judging or or trying to validate our experience by going to the Word of God. This is what I'm experiencing, and where do I validate that in Scripture? We must begin with Scripture and then filter our experiences through that. And so today, that's what we will do. Uh, We're going to ask a number of questions along the way, questions like, what is baptism in the Holy Spirit? Uh, We're going to ask questions like, is it a separate blessing or is it, as some say, the same as being converted when we are saved? Uh, And is there biblical evidence for that? And what about, what is the purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit? And can we see this baptism in the Holy Spirit modelled in and through the life of Christ? Uh, John Maxwell says that great people ask great questions. So you guys are asking great questions this morning. Must be filled with great people. Most people here will know of D.L. Moody or have at least heard of D.L. Moody. What you may not know is that a recently converted D.L. Moody uh, was walking the streets of Chicago going house to house witnessing and testifying about Christ. He had a passion and a fire on the inside and he stumbles upon a lovely lady, a lovely woman of God and witnesses to her and she says, would you please come back and see me tomorrow morning? So D.L. Moody says, you know what, no worries, I'll come back. So he goes back the next morning and this wonderful woman uh, lays hands on D.L. Moody that he might receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Nothing happened. D.L. Moody is thankful for the morning tea. He's thankful for the chat. He leaves. He finds himself three days later in another city. And as he's walking down the street, the presence of God is so thick on him, he turns to a nearby alley and says, Lord, stay your presence lest you consume me. Wow. Something happened in Chicago. Most people may or may not have heard of a gentleman by the name of N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright is the former Bishop of Durham, Church of England for those that are kind of interested. Uh, Interesting guy, fantastic New Testament scholar, uh, N.T. Wright. But N.T. Wright uh, was visiting family in America just prior to taking his position as the Bishop of Durham. It was a big responsibility that he was about to be stepping into and he was convinced, I am inadequate for this position. I I, I don't have the education that a lot of other people have. I don't have the history or experience. And he was very nervous and very, very anxious. One of his cousins was dropping him off at the airport and says, you know what, Tom, that's his middle name, Tom. You know what, Tom, I've noticed you're very anxious and you've had a lot on your mind since you've been here. He began to explain, when I get back, I'm taking this position. It's going to be very involved and I'm not sure I'm up to the task. And she said, would you mind if I pray for you? This is in the middle of the airport. He says, please. She lays hands on Tom Wright that he might receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. N.T. Wright's testimony from that moment was that he has, from that moment in the middle of the airport, spoken in tongues and has experienced and known a greater, deeper intimacy with God that he is very thankful for that carried him through those times a couple of people we may or may not know from history. Uh, I want to bring up now a statement from the AOG, and uh, you might want to take a photo, it's fairly long, but most Pentecostal churches, all charismatic, uh, by the way, what's the difference between Pentecostal and charismatic? Let's ask that question this morning and we'll settle that before we go too much further. Uh, the, this is from the AOG in America, but most Pentecostal churches would ascribe to the truth that's written in these words. They say, all believers are entitled to, I love all believers, that's a great message for this morning, all believers are entitled to and should ardently expect and earnestly seek the promise 
great word, promise of the Father, the baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire, according to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was the normal experience of all in the early church. You cannot separate the church in the book of Acts from the person of the Holy Spirit. Can't do it. Absolutely impossible, as we will see when we do our series on the book of Acts. This experience is distinct from, this is an interesting statement, distinct from or separate and subsequent to the experience of the new birth, which has somewhat been controversial. But what that basically means is uh, they are saying that this is an event that is separate to conversion and it's also, it follows or it's subsequent. I wonder what the Bible teaches in those things. Before we go too much further, uh, we'll answer the question, are we actually Pentecostal? It might be interesting to note, uh, we would call ourselves a Pentecostal church here, by the way, so don't, uh, positions vacant, pastor wanted, just wait a minute, we'll, we'll, uh, hold, hold those typing out. But, uh, but the interesting thing is, baptism in the Holy Spirit is not unique to Pentecostalism. Um, if you kind of want a brief history of Pentecostalism, it began basically at Azusa Street in the early 1900s. There were uh, murmurings before that, but prior to that, it was found amongst many pietistic groups as well as holiness movements that there was a deeper experience available to all believers. This is not just something that's been about for the last hundred years. This is something that has been experienced by many believers throughout the centuries. The Pentecostal contribution to what we know as the baptism in the Holy Spirit are three things in particular. Pentecostals traditionally will insist that it must have the evidence of speaking in tongues and that is often what differentiates Pentecostal from charismatic. So charismatic will say, you know what, you can have the infilling in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which brings about a power and an empowerment for service and living out the fruits of the Spirit, but it doesn't always have to have the evidence of tongues. They also insist that it must be separate and subsequent, and so I ask the question, are we actually Pentecostal? Don't answer that question yet. As we're seeking to understand we must ask the question, what is baptism in the Holy Spirit? Uh, if you've got your Bibles, we are going to move around this morning, but one very prominent verse is Luke chapter 3, verse 16. The setting of this is John the Baptist out in the wilderness in the Jordan River preaching a, uh, a baptism of repentance, so baptism by water. Jesus comes out to be baptised, and many were saying to John prior to that, are you the Messiah? Well, he ate locusts and wild honey, and he wore camel's hair, so probably not. But uh, aside from that, uh, he says, if your name's John the Baptist, you know what your calling is <laughs> as well, by the way. Uh, but he says, no, there's one coming after me, and now he uses baptism as a metaphor. Uh, one coming after me that will baptise you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And we must, to help us understand the metaphor that John is explaining here, uh, we have to understand what the word baptizo means. Uh, if you have a white piece of cloth and you want to make that cloth purple, what you would do in the first century is you would grab a solution of purple dye, you would take the white cloth and you would submerge the cloth in the dye and then you would uh, steadily baptizo the textiles. It's working the dye into the fabric until there's no more white left, there's only purple. It's the same word that we might use for dyeing our hair. I was thinking about dyeing my hair specifically for this morning, but wondered whether it would be noticeable. Yeah. Uh, trying to get rid of the natural blonde. But it's also what we would say of tempering steel. When you temper steel, you heat it very gently and then you soak it sometimes in oil, sometimes in water. Uh, in the first century, uh, they would say that the ship, the Titanic, has been baptisoed, completely and utterly submerged. Never tell God he can't sink a ship. And so... This is more than a quick dip. 
And as I hope we begin to understand, it's more than a past experience. John says, uh, using baptism as a metaphor, John could drench the outside with water, but what he wanted everybody to know was Jesus was the promised one who was coming who would drench us internally with the Holy Spirit. Which we will see has a greater purpose. It includes the wonderful gift of being able to speak in tongues, but... It is so much more than that. The other thing we need to know that John wants us to know, Jesus is the baptizer. I don't baptize anybody in the Holy Spirit. I can lay hands on you as anybody can. I can pray for you as anybody can. I could baptize you with water. And sometimes we're tempted to do a really deep baptism here just (laughs) just to make sure it's all washed away. But uh, you'll be pleased to know we've brought everybody up. Uh, but I can't baptise you in the Holy Spirit. Only one person can do that, and that is Jesus. Yeah. It's going to be really important as we work our way through. Uh, diving into the metaphor of baptism that John wants us to know. Uh, if you are baptised, say, in water, uh, it is some things that we need to know that kind of correlate with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's an observable event. It's not just something in your imagination. It's more than goosebumps on a Sunday. Something very tangible and very wonderful has happened, as we will see the record of Scripture support in a moment as we work our way through <coughs> Also, uh, please understand when it comes to the baptism in the Holy Spirit, it is not a climax, it is an initiation. It is a beginning and an entrance into a deeper, more intimate relationship with Almighty God that is open to everybody. Uh, And it's an immersion in a presence. As we'll touch on moving forward, when Jesus in the Gospel of John was speaking about the promise of the Holy Spirit, interestingly enough, he never said and you will pray in a different language. He never said that. I'm not, hey, what, before, position's vacant. Just hold the bus for a moment. I'm not saying that's not part of the experience that we have, but Jesus was speaking about a presence that would come and abide, an influence that would come and abide. And, of course, as is... Really important, eligibility is for all believers. Uh, N.T. Wright, the only part that I would disagree with is he would say, it doesn't appear as though the gift of tongues is for every believer. I would disagree with that. Paul says, I desire you all to pray in tongues. All means everybody. Praise God. Moving along, we can see that it's modelled by Jesus. While you're in Luke, uh, something happens to Jesus in these chapters. And it's something that is observable and it's something that everybody there saw and it's recorded in in almost all of the Gospels. Jesus was baptised, it appears something happened. He's baptised in water, then they are all out of the water praying and everybody observes, everybody sees the Holy Spirit come down like a dove. Please underline the word like in your Bible. Uh, Jesus didn't walk around with a dove on his shoulder while he was here on earth. People that were describing it said, you know what, what happened here? We don't have English words to tell you what happened. All we can tell you is like a dove came down. Something happened to Jesus. We know something happened because after the record of this in Luke 3, we make our way to the first verse of Luke 4 where it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. changed. Uh, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for that one. But I love first verse 14. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, but then he returns in the power of the Spirit. And it's from there that his ministry begins, and something is very different about the person, Jesus. Is it modelled by Christ? I believe it is modelled by Christ. And it it appears as though uh, after Jesus identifies with us in water baptism that there is an entrance into a deeper experience. The Gospel of John, as we're seeking to answer the question, what is the baptism 
in the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of John is really, really interesting. Uh, it doesn't speak in the same terms as the other Gospels, but John wanted us to tell, tell us something. Let me read to you the verses from the ESV, and later we will read them as it reads in the Greek. Verse 37 says, On the last day of the feast, and we will touch on what that feast is in a moment, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. The Greek has a separation there. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, verse Verse 38, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Uh, what is Jesus talking about? Maybe all of the audience asked the same question. John doesn't leave us in doubt. Now this he said about the spirit in whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not glorified. So what John wants us to know is what Jesus was saying here was a reference to the Holy Spirit. But what is Jesus saying? Uh, for that, we need to know a little bit of brief context around the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, I know I'm moving fast, so you might have to go back and listen to this on YouTube. But the Feast of the Tabernacles, moving really quickly, was a feast celebrating first and foremost the time that Israel was in the wilderness. And so it was the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, where they would set up tents. And it was a seven-day feast with the eighth day being the pack-up day where they kind of packed up and culminated everything. The great day that is referenced here is most likely the seventh day because uh, every day of the feast what they would do is they would take water from the pool of Siloam and then they would take that from there to the temple. And on the way there, uh, they would be singing and shouting praises to God. They would be singing the halal, which is Psalms 113 to 118. But the whole ceremony would culminate by them entering the temple and then giving the water to the high priest who would pour the wine into one bowl and the water into one bowl as a significance and as an offering. And what Israel is celebrating and what the feast is all about is they are celebrating God preserving them while they're in the wilderness. They're remembering the water that flowed from the rock, but they're also looking forward. They're looking forward to what Ezekiel promised, that there would be a river that would flow from the temple. They're, they're looking forward to the eschatological fulfillment where there would be streams of living water in the desert that everybody had spoken about. And what Jesus wants them to know is he is that fulfillment Amen. he came to give us that fulfillment wow thank you Jesus there's more to this feast which is which flows on to the light of the world and now there's more uh, as we work our way through but this is applicable to us it's uh, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water that's us uh, this should actually read which is interesting, if a man is thirsty, let him come, first of all, and let him, who, let him who believes, and let him drink who believes in me. That's how the Greek reads. If a man is thirsty, let him come to me, and let him drink who believes in me. The coming and the drinking appear to be two distinct things. It reveals a separate and a deeper experience that is available to us so what is the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Before we move any further, what is the baptism? It is an immersion. It is an inner immersion in the person of the Holy Spirit. It is not a past event that we look back and say, we're done and dusted, tick that box. It's entrance into a deeper life. It is Jesus taking the Holy Spirit and uh, baptizing our attitudes and every part of us so that no longer do you see the old person, more and more you see the Holy <coughs> Spirit. Yeah. Mm. Next question, is it separate? <coughs> okay, there's, a, there's an offer and there's a promise, but is this just what happens at conversion. And there's a lot of actual debate about this, but most of the people that say it is a conversion experience use 1 Corinthians 12, 13 to back that up. Now, those that were here last week, uh, you will know that uh, what that verse says, that uh, if you read the ESV and other modern translations, it will say, for in one spirit, we are all baptised into one body. 
And the reason why that doesn't make sense in the Greek is when it comes to baptism, you must have an agent, a baptizer, and you must have an element, water or uh, whatever it may be that you are submerging into. And so instead what that verse should read is, for by the Holy Spirit, the agent, he baptizes us or immerses us into the body of Christ. It's not a reference necessarily to... Uh, a conversion experience. Interesting thing, as we're about to make our way to the book of Acts, and if you want some references to look at later, I'll take a photo of that screen, I've quickly put them on there, but the important thing to note when we come to the book of Acts, it is a description of what happened, not a prescription of what we must do. Here's what I mean by that. Luke the historian, the guy who writes the Gospel of Luke, he's travelling with the disciples and he's not writing down an ABC methodology of what we need to do. What he is doing is describing what he sees and what happens. And so what we will actually see is, as you make your way through the book of Acts, and even the the verses that we will look at today, you can't put God in a box. You can't put God in a box and say, this is the only way God moves. You can't do that. You can't do that with the person of the Holy Spirit. But uh, is this a separate event? Every reference there is a reference to a separate event, and there's no tongues evident. Some of them spoke boldly. Some of them were filled with joy. Uh, When you come to Paul the Apostle, he has a conversion experience on the road to Damascus. Later on, Ananias says, God sent me here to pray over you that you might receive the Holy Spirit. We don't know of any tongues. Later in chapter 13, we see that Paul says, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. So something happened to Paul. But what we're beginning to see is, hang on a second, there's no algebraic formula here. We, we actually don't have a formula to control God. But what we have is somebody describing what people were experiencing. It's wonderful. But when it comes to separation, there, in my, there's two main passages. And we're going to have to dive into the book of Acts to see them. The book of Acts chapter 8 Uh, To give you a little bit of context that leads up to this, uh, Saul, of course, has been ravaging the church and uh, we know what's happened to Stephen. Uh, We read about that early in the book of Acts. Then we read how the disciples were scattered. One of them was a guy by the name of Philip, not Philip that was a disciple. He was a a later convert that becomes an evangelist. And he goes to Samaria, which is interesting. (laughs) He goes to Samaria and he begins to preach the gospel. And what happens while he's in Samaria is that signs and wonders accompany the preaching of the gospel. I've got some good news for everybody today. I hear a lot, you know what, I just want to see signs and wonders again. Okay, start preaching the gospel. You're welcome this morning. Uh, But but as we're moving along, uh, what we read about the believers in Samaria is that they believe the word of God. We believe that they receive the word of God, that's what we're told. They were, we will read throughout the, the uh, chapter 8, we will read that they were baptised into the name of the Lord. But then we read something interesting, that when the apostles heard that the Sumerians and the Samaritans had received the word of God, they send Peter and John down to pray for them. Why? Because they had not yet received, or the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on them. Definitely converted. Let's read it. If you've made your way to Acts chapter 8, begin at verse verse 12. Verse 12 would be the best verse. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news, they believing Philip about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. So they believe. They're baptised. Fantastic. Even Simon himself believed, uh, Simon the magician, a little bit about him in a moment, and after being baptised, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, Simon was amazed. 
Verse 14. Now, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them. Definitely, definitely a separate event. Uh, I, while I was in Tasmania, I was speaking with Dr. Andrew Corbett, who has a very good friend, uh, a, a guy that ministers abroad and is from the UK, and he holds to the fact that baptism in the Holy Spirit is the same as being converted. And Andrew asked him, what do you do with Acts chapter 8? That gentleman said, I don't know. What do you do? It doesn't matter how you dissect the Greek, it says the same thing. Something very tangible happened when Peter and John came down and prayed for them. And here's how we know that something different happened. Let's keep reading. Don't forget Simon the magician, eh? <clears throat> he prayed, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Oh, okay. They've been baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17, then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Wonderful, wonderful word. Received is to accept it speaks about taking in a gift. Verse 18. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Don't forget, Simon has seen all of the miracles, all of the wonders that were performed by Philip, and he never offered Philip any money. But when he sees what happens to these believers, something so wonderful that happened and so evident and tangible that Simon goes, hang on a second, how much do I have to give you to get that power? What I love about Peter's response and something for every one of us to grab is you can't buy the Holy Spirit. You can't buy him with your good deeds. You can't buy him with your theology. You can do all the years you like at Bible class. You can't buy him. You receive him. He's a gift. We serve a good God. Yep. So we see the Holy Spirit fell on them. Now, I need to clarify that word fell. If, if I said the word fall on or fall, most people would think the pastor tripped over up the front again and he's hit the ground, but that's not what this word means. This word means it's actually almost a military term where you would say that the enemy fell upon us. And what that means is they came and they seized uh, you and your land and they took possession of that land. And so what Peter's describing here is there was a moment in time when the Holy Spirit took possession. I love that. If there is one thing I'm praying for, I'm praying, Holy Spirit, take possession of me. It's very similar to the language used about Gideon, for those that were here, for our first instalment, where it's the only place in the Bible where we read in the Hebrew, uh, it says that the, the Holy Spirit clothed himself with Gideon. Wow. That's what I want. But he had not yet taken possession and he had not yet fallen on them. And Simon certainly witnesses something. If you want to turn the page to Acts chapter 10, here's how you can't put God in a box, right? Uh, what happens here is, uh, for those that know the story of Peter and Cornelius, this, this is the key chapter in the book of Acts, as we will see when we work our way through the series of the book of Acts, is this is one of the key chapters and the turning point in the book of Acts because we now read that the gospel goes to the Gentiles, uh, to a guy by the name of Cornelius who was of the Italian cohort. Would you believe that the gospel is for the Italians as well? <laughs> and now I'll know whether Michael listens to the YouTube. <laughs> but what happens is, uh, through a series of events, uh, an angel appears to Cornelius, an angel appears to Peter, lines them up... Isn't it interesting, the angel could have told Cornelius the gospel. But instead, it says, go and get Peter. That's interesting, when God wants to do something. Uh, but is there any evidence here of prior conversion? Let's just let the... I, I, I honestly don't see it. 
Uh, There is obviously a work of God in the heart and the life of Cornelius. There is obviously a work of God amongst his family and those that are around him because uh, of what is happening prior. We don't read distinctly that there was any distinct event. Here's what we read, verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, while Peter is preaching the gospel to them, while he's still speaking. And I've told the Holy Spirit, hey, listen, cut me short whenever you want. Thank you for those that said amen. It's all right. Security's got your ID and they'll check you out. You can say goodbye to those people today. It was nice to know you. Uh, While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on, same word, took possession of and seized all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift, underline that word, the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Here's what they were saying. They're standing back going, would you believe the Holy Spirit is available to the Italians? (laughs) For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. That's how they know something happened. So sometimes it must be evidenced by speaking in tongues. Absolutely. Obviously, that's what happens. In fact, as we work our way through the book of Acts, we will see there are a number of occasions when they were all filled or the Holy Spirit fell on them and they did speak in tongues immediately. But you will also find there are times when they didn't. Which means you can't put God in a box. Gordon Fee speaking about tongues and speaking about subsequence, which means does this come afterwards. Gordon Fee uh, would have to be one of, I would consider him to be one of the premier scholars when it comes to the the Holy Spirit. Interestingly enough, many say that he doesn't believe in separation, but he obviously does, Uh, and particularly if you read his books. Uh, Gordon Fee says the essential matter after all, I love this, Because you know what? We argue about tongues and we argue about signs and and we argue about does it have to directly come after or is it... Here's what Gordon Fee says. Gordon Fee says the essential matter after all is neither subsequence or tongues. What he's saying is the essential matter isn't uh, the timing of when this happens necessarily or the fact of whether they speak in tongues or not. The essential matter, he says, but the spirit himself as a dynamic, empowering presence... And it seems to me to be little question that our way of initiation into that through the experience of spirit baptism has biblical validity. Now, he would be considered a sceptic of what many Pentecostals hold to, but yet it appears as though he's not. As we begin to bring this to a close, this is my favourite, favourite chapter in regards to this. I, I, I love what God, and the reason is I love what God does in Ephesus. We've asked ourselves the question, what is the baptism in the Holy Spirit? We see that, yes, it is evidenced by speaking in tongues. And if I can digress for a moment, uh, I would absolutely validate what N.T. Wright has said, uh, particularly over the last four years since the beginning of COVID and all the challenges that COVID brought and then all the challenges that ourselves as a church family have experienced. I don't know how many times I've come before the Lord and said, I just do not know how to pray. How many of us have found seasons in our lives when we say, I don't even know how to pray. And I've just allowed the Holy Spirit to pray. And I've been so thankful because sometimes we don't have all the words. And we don't know how to pray, but we have one who helps us. Acts chapter 19, I love what happens here. Let's read through. Paul makes his way to Ephesus and it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, underline the word disciple. Uh, Disciple means a disciplined follower. Uh, He found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. But wait for what happens when they do hear. And he said, into what then were you baptised? And they said, into John's baptism. Now, John's baptism is a baptism of repentance. 
Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord, baptized into the name of Jesus. <clears throat> and when Paul had laid his hands on them, separate again, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men. Now, Luke wants us to know there's 12 men because if you know the history of Ephesus, these 12 men, filled with the Holy Spirit, radically transformed and upturned the city of Ephesus. There was a revival in Ephesus. Uh, if you know the backstory of Ephesus, it was the place where the, the great goddess Artemis, Diana, that's where she was. There was so much pagan idolatry in Ephesus, but there was such a large revival that the idol makers were going out of business and they wanted to kill Paul. And why I love this chapter is... Imagine what 120, 130, 140, couple of hundred people, imagine what a couple of hundred people filled with the Holy Spirit could do in the city of Brisbane. The purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is an empowerment. It's an empowerment to live a deeper life, it's an empowerment for service, it's the promise of a presence. The reason we have the promise of the Holy Spirit is Jesus knew we couldn't do this on our own. Yep. To those foolish Galatians, Paul wrote, speaking about the fruits of the Spirit and what he was describing in that chapter is a life that is influenced by the presence of the Holy Spirit. If we allow him to. Let's finish this morning with what we should do. You might be sitting here this morning. And you might be saying, you know what, I've heard everything you've described about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and so how, how can I be baptised in the Holy Spirit? And I would just say, seek the baptiser. Seek Jesus, press into Christ. Uh, here's what Jesus says in Luke chapter 18. Jesus is talking about prayer. And so he uses the analogy of a widow and says, look, be persistent in prayer. That's the moral and the thrust of the parable. But he goes on to say, uh, you, even though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the, Holy, will the Father give the Holy Spirit to them who ask? So if you're sitting here saying, you know what, that's something I'm not sure that I've experienced and it's something that I would like, then I would, I would encourage you to seek the baptizer and pray. Yeah. Next thing is, I, I love the term fall upon, but I've began to grow an appreciation for the fact that the Holy Spirit descends upon unoccupied territory. And that the process of the Holy Spirit seizing and taking position, possession of our lives is at the same time a process of us surrendering to his influence and his leading and his guiding, which is a lifelong process. And Paul writing to those troubled Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, he says, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And I finish with those words today. We ask ourselves, what do we do? There are those that are sitting in the room saying, I've been baptised in the Holy Spirit for many years. I would say, press in and enjoy the fellowship, the intimacy. In fact, that word fellowship means koinonia. It means contact. It means intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Uh, A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Pursuit of God, and please know that when you get to heaven, there's an exam on the book 
the pursuit of God, so you need to read it while you're here. Uh, but the, in his book, The Pursuit of God, A.W. Tozer says that the greatest revelation in his life when he, was when he realised that the Holy Spirit is a person and we cultivate a relationship with him as we would with a person. We give him our time. We give him our attention. How much time would you spend with somebody that never spoke to you or gave you any attention? The Bible leaves us with no doubt that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is for all. If you're here today and you say, you know what, I, I, I don't speak in tongues, you are no less a Christian than anybody else, I would just encourage you to seek the gift of tongues. If you're sitting here today saying, you know what, I, I'm not sure I've been baptised in the Holy Spirit, you're no less valuable uh, than anybody else, you, I would just encourage you to seek that deeper entrance of intimacy with God, which is the person of the Holy Spirit. And it's available to all. It is a immersion in the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is a separate blessing to conversion and its purpose is to impact the world. The Holy Spirit, uh, for you can get in trouble sometimes in Pentecostal circles, but the, the Holy Spirit is not for us to come here on a Sunday and just to have a holy huddle where we get all excited and our hair stands up and we get goosebumps and we go home. The empowerment and the presence of the Holy Spirit is so that not only our own lives, but our community is transformed something we can't do on our own. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, you said it is more beneficial that I go away. Why? Because your going away meant that you would come and make your home with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I would invite you into every aspect of this church. I would invite you into every aspect of our lives. For those that are seeking Holy Spirit, I pray that their eyes would be opened in their hearts.